So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do in Chile, which is with, with, which is also uh, not really a Mediterranean country, but we, we do have some Mediterranean in our country. And I don't work alone. I have a partner, which is Magdalena Calvo. Uh, we've been working together for 10 years, but I've been gardening since I'm like six years old. So in my 48 years, I've got a lot of experience. I'll show you uh, where is the Mediterranean area of Chile because we're a very narrow and long country and we have a huge area which is, which is a, a desert, the Atacama Desert and probably the driest desert in the world where in some areas there's not any record of rain. And our Mediterranean area is very small, it's just a small part of our country and is um, the space that between the two uh, central uh, red arrows. And we have also a huge part of our country, which is the Patagonia, which is very well known because of the glaciers, the snow, the ice is very cold, but, but also very wet. We have some dry areas in Patagonia also, but this is more in Argentina, but our Patagonia is wet. We have the cold, the, what, what we call the cold jungle, and we have the Campos de Hielos where all the glaciers are. To understand uh, the climate, climate in our Mediterranean area uh, is very, um, we have a lot of different climates inside of our Mediterranean area. So some of our places can have like 250 millimeters in a normal, uh, in a normal year, which is the north part of the Mediterranean area. And which is interesting is that a lot of, uh, of our very interesting native plants grow in this area. We do have in the north a lot of biodiversity and probably you know the Alstromerias, which are uh, some of our native plants. We do have like 95 or 96 different native Alstromerias. Some of them, or almost all of them just grow in Chile. So we do have a lot of interesting flora, but going south, uh, the landscape is gonna start to change and near Santiago, which is like uh, the capital of Chile, we have between 300 in a normal year, 350 millimeters. So you're gonna see that there's a lot of different plant communities. You're gonna start to see a lot of bushes and in some areas, you're gonna start to see also Mediterranean trees with what we call the sclerophic uh, forest. And because we have a lot of different landscape and we have a lot of mountains because we have coastal mountains, these mountains, a lot of hills. We do have a lot of very different uh, places, areas with a lot of different amount of rain. So we do have in a lot of different altitudes. So we got a lot of different uh, plants, like everything changes very fast in my country because of this difference. And one of the amazing things, and that's happening also in all the Mediterranean, in all, in all the world, like in California, Australia, etc., that we do have a very interesting and amazing flowering process in our area, usually very short, but very impressive, very dramatic, and with a lot of pollen and nectar, and that means that we do have a lot of diversity, like insects, insect diversity, which is very important to us. But the problem, and it happens all around the world, is that the Mediterranean area is where all we want to live because we have nice summer, uh, not that cold winter, we got some rain, etc. very good for fruit producing and agriculture. So the problem is that what happened in Chile is that we have a lot of pressure on our Mediterranean ecosystems. So there's a lot of uh, habitat and ecosystem loss, but, with Magarena, this is the area where most of our uh, works uh, has been done in the central area of Chile, in the Mediterranean area. So that's what I'm going to share with you uh, tonight, okay? First, well, we're gonna make a virtual visit to uh, like six or seven gardens, but uh, we thought with Magarena that it was very important to understand what we think uh, every time that we start a new project. And normally for us, because we have this diversity of Mediterranean climates in areas more cold, more wet, maybe more, more dry, etc., uh, the conditions of the place are very important to us. And not just the landscape or the, um, the weather, but also the culture, how people live. It's very important for us to consider this also. Wait, hang on. Uh, uh, sorry, can I interrupt you, Christabel? Christine Daniels, please, you're not muted and you're interrupting the presentation. Sorry, can you switch off? 
Thank you. What I told you is that Chile is a very diverse country from a geologic, uh, geographical and geological point of view. So we do have two different mountain systems, which are absolutely different. One going north to south in the coast area, and another one, which is the Andes, which is a lot higher. So did mean, that means that we have very abrupt changes, for example, in, oh, sorry. That, that was, I didn't. No. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Mm. Yeah. So we do have a lot of changes and we have a lot of thermal oscillation and we have a lot of diversity of, of soils. And that's quite interesting because we have to think or to know what's, what are these conditions. And so we're going to have a lot of different uh, uh, gardens to be very nice uh, uh, sky views. So usually, whenever we can, we try to borrow the Mediterranean landscape that's our garden. So you really don't know where the, uh, it starts and where it ends. It's so important for us to connect people with nature connection. So we do take a lot of care trying to design gardens that allow people to walk, to smell, because some of our native plants do have a very our scented plant. Uh, we try to make the garden so that the people can connect with nature through gardening. And it's quite important for us, uh, gardens with different sounds, insect sounds, bird songs, etc. So uh, we take a lot of care in this kind of design. And because we understand the close relationship that uh, we, that the plants and eggs and, and the plants, birds and life and wildlife uh, have with the plants, we do care a lot with the plant uh, selection because we know that uh, we can make conservation, rehabilitation. So we know the ecological role that gardens can play. It's not just because they're beautiful or they're nice, but because they can, at the same time, we can make a lot of ecology in our gardens. And especially because we're a kind of ecological island because we, we have like very big geographical barriers. A lot of our insects, plants are just endemic from Chile. They just live in my country. So we pay a lot of attention in the plant selection so that we can um, have as much diversity as we can. And because of the drought, and now we're facing the biggest drought ever recorded in our country, um, we honor the water cycle. So we're planting a lot of plants that really uh, work in this dry landscape. We're not using more. We used to use a lot of plants that need a lot of water, but now we're changing, thanks God. But because we're facing, we're on the verge of rationing of water. But we don't think just the garden as a way to save water, but at the same time, we try to infiltrate and purificate as much as we can because we think that we can use the garden as a water collector. And we've done a lot of this very interesting work. We feel very free to use native or exotic plants. So uh, you'll see in most of our gardens, a plant selection made with native plants, but also with exotic plants. We don't have any problem with that. We're gonna try to use native plants that are in danger of extinction because we think that in the garden, you can really preserve these uh, plants. And when we use exotic plants, um, we use perfectly adapted plants to the to the climate, to the weather, but we do take a lot of care of not using plants that, that, that came that can become invasive invasive plants. So we we call uh, well adapted with well behaved exotic plants. And when you work with Mediterranean, especially in the northern uh, area of the Mediterranean area of Chile, there's a lot of summer dormancies, which are not that interesting to our customers. So we have a wonderful spring, wonderful fall, wonderful winter. But when when the spring or by the end of the spring or maybe, or maybe during the summer, some of, some of our plants will have a summer dormancy that are quite difficult for our customers to, to be accepted. So we're gonna use a mixture between exotic and uh, native plants so that to try in a certain way to hide this summer dormancy uh, with flowers or maybe with colors so that uh, people don't take the plants out uh, from the garden. And because we live in a very dynamic system, and that's very important, we design with a lot of color. We love color. 
Absolutely, we love texture, we love color, but not in any way. So what we have in our Mediterranean system is, is that the plant composition, the plant colors in our system are very elegant and sophisticated. So you can have a lot of different colors and you can have the landscape ch changing very fast every three to 12 weeks, but we're gonna try to make a mixture of colors that is uh, elegant and sophisticated, at least for us. So we, we take a lot of care uh, with the color. And finally, what we're doing now, we're making what we call a multi-cycle and multi-layer plant community. So we don't think the garden just like a uh, lot of different plants working in the same place, but we understand that this association is a plant community where all the plants are affected positively and negatively by the neighbors. So every time we add a new plants, there's a whole new community that we have a completely different management, for example, or uh, it's going to absolutely uh, work different because we're adding new plants. And this is very interesting, but because what we can do is finally in a very small space, we can use a lot of diversity. So this is a picture of my garden during the summer. So in a small place, you can add a lot of different plants that will thrive and work together because we have this multi-cycle and multi-layer vision of a plant community. And that's quite uh, interesting. And the, and the last thing is that usually uh, we don't just think the water as to be safe or to be collected or infiltrated, but we're doing also uh, natural swimming pools. So we're not using more uh, chemicals in our swimming pools. We, most of our swimming pools are what we call a natural pool where you, ha where you have like crystal clear water with no chemicals because we think that the swimming pool can be also part of the ecology of our garden, of our of our landscape, okay? So this is pretty much what we think when we start like designing or thinking a new garden. Just make a little tour. So we're gonna start with Sabayar, which is in the uh, coastal area, the Northern coastal area of our Mediterranean area. And this area was quite interesting because this is what we call the uh, coastal cliff ec uh, ecosystem, which is a very long system, like hundreds of kilometers, but just very, very narrow, can have about 50 to 100 meters. Uh, I mean, it's very thin, but very large. But that's where all the people want to have their, their, their like uh, ocean house. So we've lost almost all this habitat. And there's a lot of very interesting and endemic plants that just grow in this area of our country. And what we see is that we have uh, like all the new houses that are built and usually they just wipe all the, all the coastal system. They destroy like everything. And what we have at the end is a kind of South African, Australian, very little Chilean garden, like a lot of different plants from South Africa, California, Mediterranean, so well adapted to our conditions. But this is a quite problem because a lot of our wildlife is in danger. A lot of our native plants of this area are also dis disappearing. And because the way that people work the garden, we have a lot of bare soils, and that means a lot of erosion, a lot of biodiversity loss. So uh, what we're trying to do with Macarena is that usually when we have to start in this kind of ecosystem or in this kind of gardens, we usually do a very simple design with very, very big like plants area. Uh, and we try to have as much continuity as we can. And we try to make our customers to understand that you don't need grass, you don't need lawn, you just need nice view, contemplation, uh, and try to connect as much as you can with nature. So what, we, what we're doing finally is we're making a plant community based in pioneer plants, um, and low fertility adapted plants. So we make the plant community with a lot of native plants and we do care a lot with this plant, all the plants that are endangered uh, in this ecosystem. So we're trying to make a mix. Uh, this is the garden after one or two years, usually in this area, which is very dry, the plants grow very slow. And we make a 
community they made with warm season plants and cool season plants, growing plants, because we want to have as much flowers as we can during the whole, as during the whole year. A lot of our native plants of this area do have a very nice winter spring, but not that good summer and uh, beginning of the winter. So we're going to try to use um, we're going to try to use a lot of these native plants, and we try to use the plants that attract uh, the biggest amount of uh, of insects, uh, um, birds, etc. This is this is another view with a lot of our native plants. This is one of the Alstromedias we like the most. And what we're doing, we're not just making communities with native plants from this area, but we're using also some native plants from northern because we're getting drier. So we're making new uh, plant communities with native plants, but that don't grow together. And to make this, it's quite important for us to understand the growing season of the plant, but at the same time, we're paying a lot of attention to the architecture and trying to make resilient communities with a lot of labor, with, with a lot of biodiversity and that also looks very beautiful. We've discovered and understood that, which is one of the very important things in the Mediterranean garden is a plant architecture because it allowed us to make these multi-layer systems where you can have a lot of different like plants in the same area growing together. And this is quite important when you want to try to have as much biodiversity as you as you want as you can in your garden. And at the same time, we, we're using some exotic plants like uh, the biliardera, which is from South Africa or Australia. I don't remember now, uh, which is going to be great during the whole summer, while a lot of our native plants are dormant and are not that nice. So you can have both plants at the same time with a very interesting um, looking. OK. And what we've learned with Macarena in all these years that a lot of the things that are happening to the garden were not planned. There's a lot of unpredicted situation. And this is why it's so important to be, to visit the gardens every now and then to take a lot of information. And we've learned that you can really make a huge difference when you choose the correct plant, not just for your customer because they love the garden, but at the same time, you can provide nesting sites, nectar, pollen, etc. And I think that's is crucial to understand to become a better landscaper. So what happened after this garden, uh, we started to be a lot more uh, careful about the plant selection because we can really see that we can make the huge difference between just a beautiful green and colorful garden with an ecological, amazing, uh, colorful green ecosystemic garden. You know, we can make this huge, huge. Uh, so we understood that uh, a garden that is it's not just a garden, and that in a situation and ecology. So this is quite important to us. Okay. Then we built some years ago another garden, which is a little bit northern in this area have about 200 millimeters a year uh, just during the winter with a very, very dry summer. This is also a coastal garden. And because we were in the coastal cliff, we started to have a lot of problems with erosion because usually when the house is built, there's a lot of destruction. So you have at the end of the construction, a lot of bare soil. You have a huge lobe and season is going to start. So to try to their soil short-lived or, or are intolerant to shade, you can cover as fast as you can the soil where most of the permanent plants start to grow and finally will replace these pioneer plants. Why these pioneer plants are important for us? Because they covered very fast the soil. And usually because these are very um, compacted soil, especially after all the work of construction of the house was done, in a certain way, we, when you make a good selection, the pioneer plants that we love to use here with Macarena, you have in a certain way that the root system of, the, of this short living perennial will break the ground and it's going to add a lot of carbon exudate, uh, biological life, and you will not have erosion, which is quite, quite important for us. And because this is a 
we have not that much rain and the rain is concentrating in like three months. We want to have as much water infiltration as we can. And at the same time, because we have uh, plant density, we reduce as, at the same time weeding. And that's quite important for us. Normally, the pioneer plants will disappear because the permanent plants are going to start to uh, shade them to produce shade. And these uh, pioneer plants, like this eryngium, will grow just where the soil conditions are still very bad. So they, are, they, still, they will still be very important for the garden. And what we also learn is that, that, is that when you work near the ocean, because, of that, because you have a lot of uh, wind, these pioneer plants can be very useful to try to uh, use them as a windbreak or break wind, uh, windbreak, I think, or windbreaker, and they will help uh, more sensible plants to establish. This is a garden after a couple of years, you can see that most of our uh, pioneer plants do not exist anymore. They just vanished from the system. Uh, we keep the soil, we make the restoration. So we have a garden, which is at the same time, uh, not really uh, a coastal cliff because I think it's going to take a time to restore everything. And because we, there's a lot of relationship that we still don't understand, but, that, but what we're doing in a certain way, we're helping nature to recover um, this system after what we, we did uh, building the house. I think when you work near the coast, the most challenging and complex situation is when you work near the ocean because you have a lot of salt wind, like very strong, the Pacific Ocean. I don't know uh, wh why we call the Pacific because it's everything but not Pacific very windy with big cloud, with big waves, a lot of salt spray. So um, even if the distances between the coastal cliff and this area near the ocean are minimal, you have to use an absolutely a completely plant community because the wind and the salt is so strong that just in a few meters, you have to change absolutely your community with very well adapted plants like the chistantes, which are great when you're working near the ocean. And in this garden, we had the same. This is a Puya chilensis blooming, one of our favorite plants, which is it's amazing to see our Puyas blooming. But in this garden, there's a lot of things that started to happen after we built the garden, a lot of wildlife, birds, new plants that we didn't plant that arrived with the birds. So this is um, very positive because I think that we can, in a certain way, rehabilitate our, our world. Everything we've destroyed, we can like rebuilt again or help nature to rebuild everything. And in this garden, we understood and we learned that, the, well, that with some insects have a very strong re relationship where very uh, small amount of plants. There's a lot of what we call a very specialist relationship. So we also understood that you have to have this kind of plants if you want to keep these insects and communities like, um, in your garden and you can help them because a lot of them are very endangered because of loss of habitats. And this is a Capolicana fulvicolvis, my favorite native bee, which is just a chilling one, okay? We work in the coast area, but we also work in the Central Valley. Uh, this is uh, like 200 kilometers going south from Santiago. This is a Central Valley. What you see uh, at the end is the starting of the Andes mountain. And what I love of this garden is that it's not really a garden, but this is the application of the ecosystemic landscaping for agriculture, for productive agricultural system. So this is a vineyard we produce, where uh, they produce wine and they have some small places where, where they wanted to have a garden. The customer asked us for a kind of French garden, uh, what I think is very nice, but we said that I think that we're Chilean, we're in South America, so what we need is a Chilean garden. And because the vineyard want to, wanted to make like a garden for its wine tourism project, um, we tried to make a beautiful and very nice garden, but at the same time, we started to, uh, we tried to convince, and fi finally we got it, uh, to convince our customers that you can do a lot more than just a garden. And when you start uh, selecting the plant, the correct plants, you can have a lot of uh, pest control living in your agricultural system and starting not to use as much pesticides. So we specially, um, we specially thought in this garden uh, 
trying to bring as much flower flies as we could because we know that they uh, that the young young uh, that, that the larvae um, eat uh, some pests, so they are very pre precious plague predators. But the problem is that most of our flower flies are uh, like meat when they're young, but they're vegan and go to very specific flower go to very specific specific flower when they're adult. So what we did was try to make a more ecological garden, very beautiful at the same time, useful for the winery tourism project, but uh, trying to do a lot more because we also wanted to use a garden as a marketing uh, tool uh, to sell more wine. That, that was very important for us. And usually when you have um, small wineries with not that much amount of, of land, you have to try to make your work uh, in what we call the uh, in Spanish, we call it espacio residual. Uh, I don't know how to translate that, but they are the places where they cannot plant. So usually, it is a mess. And we uh, transform this soil, which was destroyed for 20 years. Interesting ecosystem, not just making gardens, but at the same time, uh, we made a lot of work recovering all the water distribution system of the winery because we wanted to regenerate as much habitat as we could, not just for the insects, birds, mammals, but also for amphibians, because most of our amphibians living in our uh, Mediterranean system are in vulnerable state of, of conservation. A lot of, the, lot of them are endangered, so we try to at the same time uh, work with the with this water system. This is a garden after a couple of years. So you can see a lot of our eryngium, which is a very important native plant, Jarawa caudata, which is a grass, but at the same time, some plants that are not native like Perovskia. Uh, and that's, I'm gonna explain why we're using not just native, but at the same time, exotic plants, because we want to have as much nectar and pollen as we can, because this, these flower flies, which work in the, pest control in the vineyard need very specific flower to uh, reproduce. So we bring these plants, some of them were native and some exotic. So we have as much nectar and pollen as we can during almost a whole year. And that's quite important. And because this garden was at the same time touristic, we wanted to have a lot of color, flowers, etc. during the whole year because uh, for a lot of our customers still to understand the summer dormancy is not that easy, okay? So the garden takes over almost all the uh, residu residual spaces and we transform them in path uh, and we uh, work them as a biological corridor. So uh, this is not just like the tracks and all the machines uh, road, but at the same time it's a biological uh, routes because we want to connect uh, all the hill system of the vineyard with the river system, which is also in the vineyard. So we want, well, wild animals to move in this garden and not be exposed or um, you understand, um, yeah. And ob obviously we wanted to use it as a main tourist attraction. One of the interesting, interesting things of this work is that we care a lot about hummingbirds because uh, this is uh, a hummingbird a migration area. So we have a lot of migration during spring and fall and winter. So we use a lot of plants, a lot of them exotic, like some salvias, because uh, we wanted to have as much food as we could, because when you wipe everything out to plant vineyards, you need to have a lot of very interesting plants for hummingbirds, but because we don't have that much space, we want to use what we call a key plants, ecologically key plants, so kind of plant that produce a lot of food for a lot of time for this kind of wildlife, okay? Uh, we don't just work with uh, the garden, but we also work with all the watering system with the water reservoir. So at the beginning, it, it was just a reservoir of water, but we also um, transformed the water reservoir in another ecosystem with a lot of very interesting plants, exotic and native. And because we wanted to have as much wildlife as we could uh, in our vineyard. And at the end, it's called a technical wetland because we knew that a lot of, our water, of the water that we use in our vineyard was coming from agricultural use with a lot of phosphate, nitrates. So uh, we build um, we build 
an ecological system to try to remove as much uh, nutrients as we could before leaving the water again into the, ri into the river. And part of this work was done also by um, a Belgium landscapers when I'm trying, that I'm trying now to, uh, I'm trying to remember the name, but uh, I don't remember, Frank, yeah, I will remember. And this is the work we were starting to make this spreadsheet, which is unusual, but this is how we organize uh, the garden between plants that are for specialist uh, insects, the one that are for generalists with a lot of pollen. We also use a lot of plants that are endangered. We're gonna use some plants that are very useful for color dynamic, but maybe they're not very useful for white light, for example. And we also work with this to try to understand which is gonna be the appearance of the garden, the colors, the maintenance, etc., And to have uh, to be sure that we that we have what we call the continuity in the supply of food, especially for all the pest control, and that was interesting because we we also work with uh, with a, with a uh, biologist, with entomologists to try to understand which are the plants that attract which insect. How can we work to make habitats for our native bees? Because a lot of our bees are so to know which were the colors, uh, the, um, where they will drink the wine, what were they need. So it's quite important to work in a team and with other professionals, okay? Now we go to the city because usually in the coast you have a very nice, nice view. And also when you work in, in the Central Valley where you have a lot of mountains, but we always say with my, with my partner, Magarena, that with, for a lot of people, the only really um, approach into nature that they will have maybe in their entire life is going to be a garden. So we try to work as much as we can with nature also in the city. And this was done in a financial um, area, if I can say that, in Santiago. You have a lot of very big buildings, modern architecture, very nice place but a lot of concrete and not that much gardens. And usually you have a lot of the landscape of, of the landscaping that is in this kind of, um, of spaces, a lot of green, a lot of lawns, uh, like everything must uh, look perfect, but with no flowers, no color, usually no native plants, no wildlife, etc. So we made a low water and low maintenance uh, garden with a plant community that was thought very dynamic to try to connect people, uh, urban life, winter. And what we have is a very like strong color, very dynamic garden. We use some Australian, some native, as I told you, some European plants also. Uh, but the garden changed very fast. And what, we, uh, and what we build is there's a lot of areas where you are surrounded by, by, and in a certain way you can be in a small piece of nature in the middle of the city. And it was a very successful garden and people love to, to come to the coffee and to this place. And that's a very unusual approach to landscaping in Chile. Like this thing of, of having big plants uh, like and being inside of the and being inside of the um, and being inside of the of the garden someone is asking if the pampas grass are invasive but a lot of the pampas grass are, are native to chile jean pierre boucher uh, these are some of our of our native of our native plants so uh, it's not a problem we do have a lot of different uh, cortaderias uh, arucana uh, atacamensis uh, so it's not a problem, it's not invasive, it, it, it's part of our uh, native yeah. system. We're now starting to work a lot in the city because of the drought. Uh, we're working with what we call a municipalia, which we, um, I don't know how to translate that in English, but with some areas of the city. So we're trying to help to improve like um, the water use. We're trying to make more water waste gardens, but at the same time, we're trying to build plant communities to make uh, people's life more uh, happier. That was the very first that we did in, two, in 2019, uh, which was a plant community made with Mediterranean native uh, steppe plants. And the idea was a plant selection to, to reduce the irrigation needs by 80%, so with lower, lower water requirement, low watering required plants. 
And at the same time, we wanted to infiltrate as much water as we could because what usually happened like everywhere, so we have the, the rain, but because of the concrete, we have all the water going into the river. And we started to harvest as much water as we could because the Mediterranean, I always say that the Medi Mediterranean plants is not a problem, the um, warm season drought. But the big problem is the winter drought because most of, of the most of the Mediterranean plants are a cool season growing plants. So what we're doing now is we're trying to harvest as much rain as we can from the pavements, uh, roof, etc. And at the same time, uh, we use a plant, uh, a soil, technical soil. Uh, and the use of stone to the reuse maintenance because it's a huge, huge problem. We're not just having problems with water, but we're having the problem with labor. We're not having uh, much, we don't have workers for our, our gardens. And at the same time, it's getting more and more expensive. And technically, it's a, also a problem also, okay? So what we want is to bring the magic and the color of, and the diversity of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean system in the middle of the city, taking out lawns and um, planting these native plants. Uh, at the beginning, it was a little bit hard because this is a completely different uh, techniques of um, of making gardens. So this is my boss in Providencia. So at the very beginning, she was not that happy with uh, how the gardens look because at the same time, we were using a lot of stone to keep the soil moist. And at the same time, we use a stone because it's quite good for uh, reduce, reducing weeding. Uh, this is a, te a technique which is inspired in James Hitchmog and Nigel Dunnett work. And what we're doing is that we're replacing as much lawn as we can because the lawn, because of the drought, cannot be watered anymore because we've been in a 14 years of severe drought. So we have half of the rain that we used to have low. So we, we have to move into a more semi-arid or Mediterranean landscape. And what we designed was a very rich and biodiverse community, which was made with a lot of different plants coming from Mediterranean areas from all around the world, and also native plants and steppe plants. And we made a community of uh, multi-cycle, multi-layer layer community because we wanted the, the ground cover always, always plant activity, which is very important for root exudate, and because we wanted as much pollen and nectar as we could, and, and also beauty, flower, color, etc. And we're using a drip irrigation system, what we call plant to plant. This is a work when it was finished, and this is a work a year after. So you can see that the stone is not the problem anymore. So it's very it's still very useful, but was covered by, by all the, ve the vegetation. We have a lot of different flower, lot of different flowers. The biodiversity increased dramatically. So we have a lot, lot, lot of different native bees, um, honeybees, a lot of butterflies, which are very unusual in the city. And all the neighbors of, the, of this area of the city were very happy because they saw how the gardens grew and how all the plants bloom in different time of the year. So a lot of different flash of color. So people were very happy. And when you start to change the plant selection and you start to use more um, clever plants, if I can say that, you see a lot of very interesting native bees. Uh, I really love native bees. That's why I talk so much about that. And you start to see that very rare bees that you can really, really, that is very unusual to see them in the nature. You can see them in the city, which is more strange or rare. And that's amazing. So you can have, uh, you can be in a certain way part in the middle of the city, you can be part of a, an ecosystem. I, I don't know how to explain that, but you can see that a lot of these very rare and endangered uh, insects will live also in your garden. This is a garden which was made in um, near Santiago in Panquehue, which is, a, which, is, which is in the Aconcagua Valley. This is a private garden and the garden, the garden was made to preserve the Chilean palm, the Jubea chilensis, which, which is a vulnerable um, palm of our country. This is a big garden uh, with a lot of plants, a lot of um, plant communities, which is very unusual to Chile because usually we have a we have lot of lawn and not as many plants. 
but um, this is the garden was made in a very important agricultural area. So what we said to the owner is that uh, these plant communities were not just beautiful, but at the same time they were crucial for the fruit production because we wanted to have as many pollinate, uh, native insects and pollin pollinators as we could. Uh, this is what we call an alluvial valley. So we have very stony soil, very good drainage, which is wonderful. And this is when we were just uh, starting to build the garden. You can see some of the Juvea chilensis, which are the center, which are our native Chilean palm, and also some phoenix that were rescued also. And this garden has a wonderful view into the majesty of the Aconcagua Valley, which is absolutely amazing. At the end, you have the Aconcagua Mount Mountain, which is huge. You can see the Andes at the end. And it was the same. We made a water-wise, low-maintenance, multi-layer and multi-cycle community. It was made with native and exotic plants. We designed it to maximize the insect diversity. We used uh, um, Chilean palm, which were, uh, which were transplanted. They were transplanted. And at the same time, we uh, build the pond because the water is quite important in this system. And we use what we call a biofilter to keep the water crystal clear and biological, biologically pure because we wanted to uh, have, because we bring them again, they're extinct in this system, but we wanted to bring some native, some native fish and also some native amphibians. You'll see that there's some exotic plants like the Iris germanica, but at the same time, we have a lot of our native grasses. This is like the first or second year. This is what we call the multi-cycle system. So we have a lot of native grasses, but we have a lot of exotic plants in between. Uh, with different blooming seasons. So this is a garden that usually is full of flowers almost the whole year. It's very um, dynamic, a uh, lot of insects, uh, very interesting path to walk in. This is the pool, uh, which is not a natural pool, it's more a pond, which was made with what we call a biofilter. Here you, here you have the plant community and the substrates that are keeping the water crystal clear. A lot of dragonflies and very useful things that live in this area and also native amphibians and some of our native uh, uh, sweet water, no, soft water. Um, no, yeah, but a lot of our native fish also living here, which were brought because they were extinct in this area. These are some of the views of the garden. So you can see that the water is coming from what we call the acequia, which is an irrigation system, and is coming to replenish uh, the water system. And we, we did, which is a reinterpretation of what the Italians call the cadena tiagua, but in a more um, modern shape. This is a garden by the end of the summer. So there's a lot of changes in the color. And again, we're gonna have like three to six weeks of different colors, different combinations. And that makes the garden very dynamic. A lot of flowers also, that means a lot of insects and are quite interesting. Here you have the native palms. You can see they're huge and they have like a great trunk, which is amazing. Very, very interesting. And then we have a different garden. And you can see how dry the central area of Chile has become. Um, we're turning into more it's an arid region than uh, what we call a Mediterranean, but it used to be Mediterranean. So that's where all, most of the Chilean people live. So you can imagine what happened with all the environment because of this amount of people, a lot of deforestation, uh, of grassing, so a lot of the plants have disappeared. But this is quite interesting park because it connects different systems, the hill system with the valley system. It is called what we call a linear park. It has like three kilometers. It's quite long, very narrow, but we built and thought the garden as a connector between these two uh, mountain range and the valley. We use a lot of stone, a lot of semi-arid, uh, water wise plants at the same time. Uh, as you can see, some of them are native, so some of them are Mediterranean, but from the from Europe, um, Canary, Canary Island, uh, Europe, California, etc. cetera. Uh, it's very dynamic and dramatic in, in the color and, and it's very water wise. We think that color is very important for people living in the city. Uh, because as you can see, everything is very brown during the summer. So um, we're trying to keep the garden 
with a lot of flowers during um, the whole the whole year to keep people happy. And at the same time, because of the drought and because of the construction, usually Chilean people love to have a big lawn, but not plants. It has become a very important wildlife refuge of this area. So you will find a lot of birds, uh, small mammals. You will also find a lot of rep reptiles and a lot of very interesting insects in this area. And we think that we can build a garden, not just to have a nice garden, but at the same time as a refuge for wildlife, okay? And then the last garden, and I like to show this garden because uh, this is very strange. I mean, to a supermarket parking area. So usually, I don't know what happened in Europe, but it, it, it has to be pretty much the same that in the States or, or in Chile, that no one cares about the supermarket parking area. And usually you have a few flowers, you can have lawn, but usually you have a very big garden that needs a lot of water, a lot of maintenance, and is visually not very interesting and biologically is absolutely a green desert. And we're working, I would say, not really in the Mediterranean area, but more in the dry area. This is the desert, the coastal desert. So you have about 70 millimeters of rain in normal year, but you can have not that often, but every four or five years, which is called the super bloom, all the Atacama Desert blooming, when you got like 120, maybe you can have just 100, you can even have 200 in a very rainy year, and you got all the desert, which is brown, blooming, a super bloom, pretty much like what happened in California, and it's absolutely amazing. So we're gonna use very few water, very few maintenance, and, uh, we're trying to make understand to our customers that you can transform what we call a residual space, so space space that no one cares, into really a site where you can make in situ conservation, and it works. So you can uh, make a conservation of the soil, endangered plants, wildlife, and at the same time, if you want, and that's starting to be more and more important in Chile, you can even have some environment. In, environmental certification, and you can also have a marketing opportunity because you're making things better than other uh, producers. This is what we call the super bloom. It happens every four or five years, it depends. Uh, you can see that usually the Atacama Desert is absolutely brown with no plants. In some areas, you can have some bushes, but then you have some rain and you have like carpets of flowers. It's amazing. Really, really nice to visit with a lot of different plants, combinations, colors, very dynamic in color and the color cycles. You will have a lot of different kinds of altromedias, which are my favorite plants. That's why I show them all the time. They're very inspiring for, for me, especially the way they uh, mix uh, colors. And you have like carpets of whites and blues and pink and mauves and purple and yellow and everything changing every three to four weeks. So you can have a, a, different gardens every three or four weeks, which I, which I think is absolutely amazing. So we use this inspiration to try to understand how colors, how plants work in the system. And we try to make an interpretation, I would say, with almost only native plants of the coastal system into this uh, supermarket uh, parking area and making a lot more better than just planting lawn saying about the 90% of the water that usually they, they thought they were going to use in this area. Usually, I always say that, that when I work in an area, I always look at native plants or native flowers to try to uh, understand which is the color dynamic of the place. This is called what I call the inspiring muse, if I can say that. And usually I use some very specific altromedias that will grow, grow that will grow in the area to try to see and understand which are the colors that mix. And I'm going to try to use these colors in the garden. This is a, you can see usually you have a, 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 a space that can be quite, quite interesting. So a big place, usually you have a lot of parking. And this is uh, Chile. It happens to say that in America and Argentina that we do have a lot of space. So usually the parking area is a big place, a uh, big space because sadly we use uh, the car a lot. And look what we're doing. So uh, we're planting the plants with no soil preparation because we're using plants adapted to the condition. Usually when you start working with native plants, you understand that you have to plant them as small as you can because they're gonna work a lot better than when you use big plants, uh, not 
no soil preparation, just this compactation. What soils are compacted, we're going to make some work, but usually we try to not to touch the soil um, because we we now understand that we thought that we have that we have a lot of soil biology and we want to keep as much as we can of this biology and we're going to try even to add a lot more with compost or humus. You see that we generally use what we call a plant to plant drip irrigation system. Well, very well. So we save a lot of water and that's what we have a year later. So a lot of the plants really grow very fast. So everything is going to be absolutely covered. These plants are adapted to desert. I mean, normally these plants are coming from areas where you have about 150 millimeters of rain. In this area, you just got um, 70. So we're going to water the garden, but we're going to water like every four weeks, once a month with some 20 liters. And that's going to be enough to keep the garden blooming. Everything was covered. We have a lot of flowers, a lot of insects, a lot of um, wildlife. And which was very interesting is that a lot of the people started to ask, where are these plants from? Because I, I have never seen them before. And these are just the plants that grow uh, in the hills. So that was so interesting because we could make some education to show the people that we do really have amazing native plants that you can use in landscaping. If you make some plant selection and combination, you can have the garden green the whole year with very a lot less water than the lawn. And at the same time, you're gonna see that a lot of very interesting things are gonna happen in the garden. And some of this plant starting to become very popular because the people that, that live in the neighbors started to know them, start to see how they grow at the simple that they are to keep them growing and blooming. So I think that we're not just making ecology, that we're not just making people happier, but at the same time, we're teaching people how to use native plants and show them that you can make really amazing combinations and that these plants uh, has a lot to offer. But because we don't know how they work, how they grow, where you can use them, much you have to water them, a uh, supermarket, uh, parking area can be absolutely amazing. And which is a plant to plant irrigation system uh, is that normally uh, because we're using different plants that are coming from different system, for example, name none, I can use a plant coming from a system of millimeters and use plants which is coming from 50 millimeters per year, for example. So if I use this drip irrigation system, usually what you have is a drip irrigation system that water everything with water. But with this plant to plant, we have uh, a number of um, flabber, which is like the what, what water finally. Maybe you can have, for example, in one plant, five of, of this small flabber. So you're gonna have per hour of watering 20 liters, but in another plant, you're gonna have just one. So you're gonna have like four liters for the plants. So you can make differences. You can water more some plants than others. And that's what you, what you can make is like, you have more freedom to make plants combination, watering some plants more and some, some watering less. And about the nurseries, when we start to work with native and water waste plants at the beginning, it's a little bit uh, a problem. But what we've done with Macarena and with a lot of nursery people is that we collect the seed. Sometimes we also collect some bulbs, etc. Uh, to make this plant to, to be produced in a commercial way, to have more. And that's quite, quite, quite uh, important because, for example, we collect some plants that are really on the verge of, ex of extinction. For example, one of the Altromedias that really grow in a very, very small area where a lot of people are just building houses and are destroying everything. So with these bulbs, we produce like hundreds of these Altromedia and we, if we use it in our garden. So now, we, we feel a little bit better because we know that we have uh, all these plants in a certain way are preserved. So uh, in a certain way, we're making preservation through collecting and uh, making the nurseries to produce these native plants. And what you wrote, Nan, is, is that, that we're using different number of emitters per plant to try to customize the irrigation for plants. So. We just have plants that can have like 100 liters and you can have the other having just four liters, which is very interesting. 
And that's for the presentation. This is also a picture of the garden. You can see a lot, lot of insects blooming up here, etc. But I think the more interesting things to share is that when you make nice gardens, uh, you have a lot of people being interested in more like ecologically or, or native plants that they didn't know before because we don't use them. And that's quite interesting. And we do have a lot of very interesting plants. And at the same time, what we've learned is that when you make plant communities with the exotic and native plants, you can help pe people using native plants with summer dormancy, using like a plant that grow in the opposite season and in a certain way is going to hide the dormancy that you really don't like that much so that you can have the native and the exotic plants living on the same on, on the same area using of course plants that are uh, non-invasive and the nurseries yes they sell endangered plants uh, they're not that common usually for example for lucumillos or for some of uh, they don't have thousands of plants but we're producing more and more and more and we're collecting seeds cuttings to try to make them more available because a lot of people are starting to understand uh, to understand that they can use uh, these plants. And someone is asking about pioneer plants. And I would say that pioneer plants are plants that usually grow when you have, for example, fire, or you can have like um, a big drought that everything dies. Pioneer plants usually are the plants that start to work the first. Usually some of them are short-lived short -lived perennials. Some of them are just annuals, but they are the first plant that usually appear. They love the sun, they love this disturbance of the soil, but they hate sh um, shadow in general. So we use, the, we use them at the very beginning and the plants that we want at the end of the garden will finally grow, cover them. And so they're gonna work at the very beginning, but uh, we, we will not have these um, plants uh, because they will disappear because of the other plants. Okay. Uh. <laughs> right, so, okay. Um... Fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you, Christabel. Amazing to see technical and ecological and biodiversity goals, but just gorgeous gardens, literally. Thank you. Beautiful gardens that understand people, our need for color and education, you know, and, and that summer dormancy isn't a great favorite. I'm sorry, there are going to be some fundamentalists among us that. Uh, um, you know, so I'm going to go to Maggie now and just so she can read. I see that you've yes. asked several questions along the way, but um, there, there are a few more go. questions, Angela. So um, yeah. um, thanks for answering some of them as we went along. Um, one question is about how long do you keep the irrigation tubes in position when you're sort of establishing a garden? But usually we always water the garden. It depends on the area where I grow, for example, where you where you build the garden. If I work in the north area of the of, of my country, of the Mediterranean area, we're having less than 100 millimeters per year. We used to have like 200, but we're getting half the rain. So we water the garden and we're watering about seven liters per square meter every two weeks. That's what we're using because I mean, summer dormancy is quite interesting as an adaptation to drought, but this is quite a problem for landscapers because a uh, lot of people understand and like the summer dormancy because, because you can have very dramatic summer dormancy. I love that. For example, with the Fuchsia lysioide, one of our native plants that's like a sculpture. The customer is going to see that and is going to take the, the Fuchsia away because he thinks that the, the Fuchsia die. Mm -hmm. So if you water the fuchsia lysoide, for example, in the winter, you start watering the plants in fall. So now give this plant like seven liters per square meter during two weeks, everything bah, is growing and blooming and it's going to be amazing. Probably I will not water the garden during the winter because I, I usually get some rain, but I will give another watering, for example, in August, maybe in September, and by the end of October, because it's this native it's going to grow a bit more. It's going to have more blooming season. It's going to look nicer before going to dormancy. And because 
a uh, lot of our native plants are adapted to drought, but if you water them just a little during the summer, you're gonna have the difference between uh, a plant that is looking almost dying into an absolutely green and amazing plants. So we water like 90% less or 80% less than the normal garden, but usually we garden the, we water the garden always because, and in the southern area of our Mediterranean system is different because you can have a thousand millimeters per year, like, or maybe you can, ha you can have 800 millimeters a year and it's completely different. So maybe you're gonna need to water the garden four times in, in the warm season, but where I live, you have to water a, li a, little, a little bit more. So usually we keep the watering, but with less water, absolutely than what you need in a temperate garden or in the lawn garden, which is the most popular, sadly, kind of garden that you see in my country. Green lawn, green lawn, green lawn everywhere. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question about is whether fire is an issue or not, and how you manage the grasses when the, in the down season in no. relation to fire protection. Our, our Mediterranean system is adapted to fire, but it's quite different to the Australian, South African, or the California system. So we don't have a natural fire, except when we have volca volcanic eruptions. So when you have eruption, you yes, you will have fires. It's obviously you have magma, lava coming, but normally you don't have fires. So you have like uh, man-made fires, which is a problem but we don't have spontaneous fire. So it's not really a problem for us. It's not like in California that you really have to take care mm. with the fires or in Australia. But in mm. our system, the, the fire is not a problem really. We do have a lot of fire adapted plants, which is great. So a lot of resprouting, and that's quite useful when you work in public spaces, because you know that you can cut back the garden, and especially because you don't have technical workers, it's great because you can destroy the garden and you know that everything will grow again. And that's quite useful when you work in public spaces. But uh, we don't think very much in the fire. As uh, for example, I know that John probably Greenlee, and nice to see you, John, uh, probably thinks a lot of fire or maybe Shan in, in California, but in Chile, fire is not a big issue and okay. hope won't be in the future. There's uh, lots of very positive comments about how beautiful the gardens are. And somebody's asked, what's the best month to visit them? Well, as with every Mediterranean garden, I mean, the spring probably is wonderful. But because we make a quite um, big plant selection, so when we're planting a garden, we're not just using 10 or 15 different plants. So we're using a lot of diversity. and. What usually happened in the Chilean landscaping and what used to happen was like a wonderful spring, but very sad summer, like and sad winter. So what we're trying to do is that to have a less happy spring, to have a lot more happier summer, fall and winter. So because we're using this approach with plant communities, like almost every, uh, every, uh, how can I say, you can visit the garden and find the garden nice almost the whole year. But I would say from October to March probably is the best season. But if you want to visit Chile, the Mediterranean system, October is amazing because you have all the north blooming. If you have the desert, the super bloom, you will have the desert blooming and all the Mediterranean system will, will, will be blooming also. So mid of October to mid of November, by far the best. Okay, if, if there's not a drought, because there's a, uh, a group that came in 2019 and that was very sad because everything was dry because we got a huge, huge drought. But in a normal year between 15 October to uh, November 15, great to come to Chile. Great. Um, somebody's asked if it's at all possible to have a plant list and they particularly noticed there were lots of blue plants in your slides that they obviously quite liked the look of. Is it possible for you to send a plant list of some of the plants that you use uh, regularly? Uh, that would be great. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, okay. Um, John Greenley apparently has got a question. If there's time, if he's still on the. I'm still here. Zoom. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, hola, amigo. Hey, uh, the grasses that you you were showing, I think a stipa in particular that you used in quite a few of the projects. What's the species? Uh, what's the season? 
It's the species. Cultivar. Ah. Cultivar. It's called, it's a, I mean, we usually, um, it used to be, I'm writing on the on the chat, it used to be Stipa Caudata, John, but you know that botanists are always changing the name. So now I think it's Jarava Caudata, which is a cool Magenta. season. Uh, Stipa Caudata, I, I wrote it in the chat. You can see la, the number, but now I think it's Jarava Caudata. Uh, I love the Jarava Caudata because of two things. Amazing cool season grass, amazing. Amazing in the spring because it's, it's like a golden, how can I say? It's a golden, wow. but you understand it has this golden color. And what I like the most is that the seeds is wonderful to attract native birds. So you will have like in December, like hundreds of birds in your garden taking the seeds. And that's quite interesting because it doesn't recede because the birds make the work. It's not like the stipa tenuissima or this kind of, of grasses that recedes everywhere because like 99 of the seed is going to be eaten by the birds. So it is very unusual to see this grass receives in your garden. Amazing, very low water requirement and very simple to manage. Love it. I'm pretty sure I have I an question and I look forward to, uh, to making a crop of it. I found it not to be uh, invasive in any way, shape or form. Uh, like the uh, Stipa tenuissima, so. So I'll see you in October. So it's yeah. going to be sitting and we can make some plants exchange. <laughs> if they stick in my socks, I, I don't think. Uh, Absolutely. You know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. All right, Great. thank you. There's another question about a particular plant which apparently does very well in the south of England, uh, Chilean plant Luma apicul apiculata. Yeah. And the question is whether that's used in gardens in Chile or, or is it? Yeah. Yes, we do use it a lot, but this is more temperate plant. So we're going to use the Luma piculata from, from Concepcion to the south, which is a, our temperate system. So for, for Patagonia. So if you water the Luma piculata, it's going to grow with not a problem, but it needs a lot of water. And which is amazing, the Luma apiculata uh, grows in very wet, 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 wet. Um, in wet soils. And it's very um, plastic, if I can say that. So you can also make it grow in not wet, wet uh, soils, but still needs a lot of water and has like an orange trunk, which is amazing and a quite um, amazing scent. So if you touch it, you're gonna have like an apple and pineapple scent, which is very nice. And it's very common in our temperate system. And we use it a lot in our, usually to make hedges uh, because you can prune it a lot and we use it a lot in, in, in our temperate gardens, yes. Uh, lots of very positive comments about the diversity and the ecological um, considerations and so on. But another question is about how the supermarket car park garden came about. Because, you know, how things in, in life happen, which is very strange, because I, I built the garden of the owner in Santiago, oh. in the capital. It was, it was a very small garden. And the approach of the way we landscape was very unusual for him. And I was always talking to him that it was so important to save water, to save money, uh, to use more water wise and beautiful plants. Uh, we had to think in ecology. And then I knew, because I didn't know, that he was the owner of a, of a supermarket uh, brand in the north of Chile. And then we started working with him and we built this parking park, which was for me very inter interesting because what I told you, usually in Chile, all the malls or supermarket or commercial gardens are just a green desert and you can make a small ecosystem, save a lot of money to the owner because they're water wise, low maintenance, but at the same time, I mean, to see beautiful gardens change, change your soul. I don't know how can, how can I translate that, but you understand. That's why we're here. We love plants. We love gardens. We love beauty. And when you build a beautiful garden, you change people's to make them happier. Indeed. Um, I think that's about it in terms of the questions. I'm sure uh, people could carry on all evening, but <laughs> but again, lots of very very positive comments about how beautiful the gardens are, how interesting the presentation was. So. Thank you for that.
And Angela, you have the presentation in PDF. So if any one of you can watch okay. the presentation again, etc., please, it's it's open. Don't worry. Okay. So so Christopher, if you would then send me also, if if possible, a plant list, I okay. can I can send this to every participant. And probably um, you see some like spelling mistakes or a strange yeah. word in the presentation. Remember, I speak Spanish, so yeah. to speak in English is, is a little bit is a little bit uh, a problem for me. But well, when uh, we're all uh, fluent, you'll understand. When we're all fluent in Spanish, then you know, then we'll then you can comment on it. You know, we'll, then we'll be able to comment. Okay, Great. so I'll send that out to everybody who came to the the, the session this evening. Thank you on behalf of everybody. Uh, absolutely engaging and interesting and stimulating and inspirational presentation. Thank and you. And I feel Hello. absolutely honored. So thank you so much for the invitation, Angela. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Thanks for being with us. Bye.